and Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. universe, the one who's in control. He saved me, and he will keep me till the end. The rock of my salvation, on Christ I will depend. My hope is Jesus. My hope is Jesus. When darkness hides my Savior's face, I rest on His unchanging grace. When faith is weak and doubt is strong, I still lift up salvation's song. Soul, the ruler of this universe, the one who's in control. He saved me, and he will keep me till the end. The rock of my salvation, on Christ I will depend. My hope is Jesus. My hope is Jesus. Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. When he shall come with trumpet sound, trumpet sound. On Christ I will depend, my hope is Jesus. He me, and he will keep me till the end. The rock of my salvation, on Christ I will depend, my hope is Jesus. My hope is Jesus. Hey, it's Pastor Jerry Burns, the pastor here at Kitchener Baptist Church. Our live stream is going to begin in just a moment. But I wanted to come on and just to welcome you to our service. Whether you're a first-time visitor or whether you're a regular attender, it is truly an honor to have you join us today. Our prayer is that God would use this service to bless your heart. We're not here to entertain. We're here that the Spirit could use this service to draw you closer to our Savior. And so get rid of any distractions that may pull your attention away from our worship service and make sure your Bible is handy and let's worship the Lord together. God bless you. Again, thank you for joining us and let's begin our live stream today. Thank you. 
our morning service we're glad that you're joining us we're going to begin our service this morning with 455 455 in my heart there rings a melody if you're able to stand together we'll sing on that first verse 455 Gracious Heavenly Father, we're thankful for all the wonderful blessings that you have given to us. We're grateful for the wonderful salvation that we can have and enjoy, that we can have that melody ringing in our hearts. And I pray, Lord, that you would just work in our hearts during this service. I pray for every aspect of it. May it glorify your wonderful name. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. And let's take our hymn books once again. We're going to sing In the Garden. It's 264, 264 in the garden.
and play an operatory, My Jesus, I Love Thee. But before they do that, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have in serving you. I pray, Lord, that you bless each gift and each giver and use what has been given, Lord, for the furtherance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and to use as you see fit in the ministry. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. that special ladies we're going to sing the next hymn for this morning hymn number 453 he keeps me singing hymn number 453 
life was wrecked by sin and strife. This court filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept the cross of broken strings, stirred the slumbering cords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Feasting on the riches of his grace, resting beneath the sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face, and his wife shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the past seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing. Singing as I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me. Far beyond the starry sky. I shall fling my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sweetest name I know. Wonderful singing this morning. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, tonight, Faithway Baptist College of Canada will be with us. Uh, we will not be having our, our marriage uh, series tonight. Uh, Faithway will be singing and preaching for us. I hope that you can come and be a part of it. You'll be blessed by the music uh, tonight at six o'clock. And then for the month of July, uh, we're going to change our schedule just a little bit. We're going to move uh, to an afternoon service through the month. We would like to go outside for an outdoor service if the weather permits, but we'll have our regular 1030 service and then a 130 service uh, outside. You can bring your lunch to the property and have lunch uh, on the property with your family. You'll have a, a great time and then service at 1.30 uh, and then we'll be moving our service from 6 o'clock to 1.30 uh, in the afternoon. That will only be for uh, the month of July. And then on July the 24th, uh, Eric Levier, missionary in Quebec, will be with us. He'll be preaching for us uh, all day. Uh, our afternoon service and our morning service. Uh, it's going to be a special missions Sunday as we focus our attention on world evangelism. All right, let's look at our victory verse for the month of May. It's Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. You can find it in your Bibles or on the screen behind me. We'll say the reference together, then let's say the verse. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Let's sing our chorus together. The God on the mountain is still God in the valley. Let's go. 
glad God is always the same in our life each and every day. Let's take our hymn books together right before my wife comes and sings for us. We're going to sing number 118, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. If you're able, let's stand together. 118 as Brother Mark comes and leads us.
Though fires and floods would seem to hide his plan for you, though trials and afflictions seem Amen. Let's take our Bibles together this morning and let's find the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58 is where we are. Isaiah 58. We'll begin our reading in verse number 1. Isaiah 58, verse number 1. The Bible says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. The word preach means to herald, to sound one's voice like a trumpet. God says, Isaiah, preach. Don't hold back, preach. And show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, In the day of your fast, ye find pleasure and exact all thy labors. Behold, ye fast for strife and debate and to smite with the fist of the wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day to make your voice to be heard on high. It is such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul, Is it to bow down his head as the bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him that they'll call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? Let's pray together. Lord, I pray you would help us as we look at your word. I pray you would speak to our hearts and I pray that you would draw us closer to you and Lord, I pray that you would help us, each of us, to examine our own hearts to see where we are in our standing with you. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to hear your word. I pray, Lord, you would hide me behind the cross, give me the words to say. I pray you would bind Satan and his demons. May your word fall on good ground this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever felt in your life like God just isn't fair to you? Maybe you've not said it 
in words, but you thought, I serve you, Lord. I give to you, Lord. And yet still this specific trouble has come into my life. Yet, yet still this specific circumstance has plagued me. This was where Judah was in their life. In verse 1, God speaks up to Judah, and God speaks directly to Judah. He said, lift up your voice like a trumpet. In this command, he says, to preach the truth and hold nothing back. In verse number 2, we see that Judah's reputation did not line up with their reality. They had a facade. They, they, they lived a particular way. They, they demonstrated or showed a particular life, but their heart was not near to God. They had a reputation, the Bible says, that loved righteousness. And in fact, from the outside, it looked like that they were a people who delighted to approach God. In verse number 3, they say, why do we even fast? Lord, why do we even come to church? Lord, why do we even give? Lord, why do we even read our Bible? Have you even seen us? Have you even heard us, Lord? We do all of these things, and yet this is our response from you. We're captives in a foreign land. In verse 4, the Bible makes it clear that they fasted for their own selfish needs. I don't know if you've ever had the attitude deep in your heart that if I live the Christian life, God should bless me. I deserved to be blessed. We don't deserve anything. <laughs> we deserve hell at the end of the day. <laughs> and Judah had this attitude in their heart. I deserve this, Lord. You owe this to me. And yet God reveals their heart. He says, you fast to be seen of men. Your fasting is empty and hollow. Your worship is useless to me. You see, they went through the motions. And yet they did not have a heart near to the Lord. And God reveals in this passage of Scripture worship that matters. He says in verses 6 and 7, he says, listen, if you want to worship me, then it begins by being right with your brothers and sisters. In the New Testament, the Bible teaches us this. If we want to approach God or worship God and you have ought against your brother, make right with your brother and then come and give your gift to the Lord. And God says in this passage of Scripture, if you want to truly worship me, then He says, be a blessing to those in need, those who are struggling, those who are hurting. Come and help them and, and help your brothers and sisters. And then in verse number 8 to 12, He responds by saying, listen, you need to come to me with a true heart. A true heart. Stop pointing fingers at other people. Oh, they do this and they do that and their Christian life is this. And God says, look at your own heart. And look at where you are. Delight in the Lord, He says in verse 14. And follow Him. In Isaiah chapter 58, really what we have is a cry for a pure heart. Judah wanted to see the Lord. Judah wanted God to be at work in their life, and yet God says, listen, if you want to see me, you've got to have a pure heart. You've got to have right motives. You've got to come to me and seek me with all of your might. I want you to turn with me to the New Testament, to the book of Matthew. Would you turn there? The Gospel of Matthew and the fifth chapter. Matthew chapter number 5. And notice what the Bible says. We'll begin our reading in verse number 3. Matthew chapter 5 and verse number 3, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are, look at this, the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. In verse number two, we see salvation begins with humility. If you're going to be a Christian today, you've got to humble yourself before God. You have to admit your sin and understand that Jesus is the only way to save you and humble yourself before the mighty hand of God. Salvation begins with humility. Someone said, he that is down needs fear no fall. He that is low, no pride. He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I am content with what I have, little be or much. And Lord, contentment shall I crave because thou savest such. Salvation begins with humility. And the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Bible teaches us salvation begins with a humble heart. And then the Bible teaches us as we mourn our sinful condition, we will find comfort. As we hunger and thirst for righteousness, God will meet that need. As we show mercy, God will show us mercy. And as we clean our heart, then we will see the Lord. Someone said of Matthew 5, that this is a wonderful picture of a redeemed individual. John Patton was a missionary to the New Hebrides Islands. And one night, hostile natives surrounded the mission station intended on burning out the Patons and killing them. Patton and his wife prayed during this terror-filled night that God would deliver them. When daylight came, they were amazed to see that their attackers had left. A year later, the chief of the tribe was converted to Jesus Christ. Remembering what had happened, Peyton asked the chief what had kept him from burning down the house and killing him that night. The chief replied in surprise, who were all those men with you? Peyton knew no men were present, but the chief said he was afraid to attack because he had seen hundreds of big men in shining garments with drawn swords circling the mission station that night. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. They shall see God at work in their life. The Bible says in order for us to see the Lord, we must have a pure heart. You know, we live in a society today which is constantly telling us that experience and possessions bring happiness. Some believe that a new car or a boat will bring joy. Others are convinced that a vacation experience is really the answer. However, when that when that car or that boat gets dented, and when those credit card bills come in, the thrill is all gone. Mature Christians know that experience and possessions apart from character in the heart are empty illusions. You see, the pure hearted Christian is truly blessed with God and God alone. Someone said this, much of my life is spent talking to people who believe in change of circumstances is just what they need in their life, when in reality what they need is a change of heart. If only the circumstances of my life would be different, Lord, I would serve you, I would give to you, I would follow you, and yet they don't need a change of circumstances. What they need is a change of heart. Judah needed a change of heart. They had a confused idea of God and His blessings for their life. Now the Sermon on the Mount in in Matthew chapter 5 illustrates this wonderfully. It's really a series of life truths. It's practical in His teaching to help us in the Christian life. 
The Bible teaches us in Matthew 5 how we can have a blessed life. The Beatitudes, as we call them, are really the attitude of a happy person. Do you want to be a happy person? Then look at the Beatitudes in the Christian life. Jesus Christ is our teacher. And He's teaching us how we can live the blessed life. How does the blessed life happen, Judah? It happens with a pure heart. You've got to change your heart, not your circumstances. I want us to look at this together if we could. Number one, if you're taking notes with me, I want us to notice the definition of pure in heart. The definition of pure in in heart. What does the thought of heart mean? Now, when we talk about our heart, we're not talking about the muscle in our body that's constantly pumping blood. I think you understand that. We're talking about the whole inner self. We're talking about the totality of your innermost being, who you are. Now, when we think about our heart, the Bible says, trust the Lord with all of our heart and lean not in our own understanding. Someone said that the heart is how we pay the bills of life. The heart is how we pay the bills of life. From our heart flow every issue of life. Now think about this for just a moment. When we think about trusting the Lord with all of our heart, heart. What does, what's involved in the heart? Well, first of all, we know that emotions are our heart. John chapter 14, verse 1, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. So our, we talk about our heart, we're talking about our, our emotions. We talk about our heart, we're talking about our intellect, our thinking mind. Mark chapter 2, verse 8, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye th these things in your hearts? So our heart involves our emotions, our heart involves our intellect, but, but also our heart involves our will. Daniel purposed in his heart. He made a resolve that he was going to do what was right. So the Bible says, the pure in heart. The, the thought of pure means no guile. It speaks of integrity as opposed to duplicity. The Bible teaches us that we are to have no guile. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, in whose spirit there is no guile. And so when we come to the Lord, God wants us to come with a genuine heart. Listen, God wants us to be real. He doesn't want us to have a form of godliness. He doesn't want us to, to carry our Bibles with a smile on our face, and yet our heart is far from God. He wants us to be real. No guile. Pure in heart. Jeremiah 32, verse 39, And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. A pure heart is a heart that seeks God and follows after God alone. The psalmist said, My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise to the Lord. You see, a pure heart is, is genuine. And Judah didn't have a genuine heart. They went through the motions, they went through the fast, and yet it wasn't in worship to God. It was for an outward show. United Airlines Flight 93 was a passenger flight which was hijacked by four terrorists on September the 11th, 2001 as part of the September 11 attacks. It crashed into a field near the Diamond T Mine in Stony Creek Township in Pennsylvania near Shacksville during the attempt by some of the passengers to regain control, killing all 44 people on board that plane that day. No one on the ground were injured. 
The aircraft involved was a Boeing 757-222. It was flying United Airlines' daily scheduled morning domestic flight from the Newark International Airport in Newark, New Jersey, to San Francisco International Airport in San Francisco, California. The hijackers breached the aircraft's cockpit and overpowered the flight crew approximately 47 minutes after that plane took off. Zayad Jaraf, a trained pilot, then took control of the aircraft and diverted it back to the east coast of the United States toward Washington, D.C. The hijacker's specific target is believed to be the United States Capitol. After the hijackers took control of the plane that day, several passengers and flight attendants were able to make some telephone calls, and they learned that the uh, attacks uh, they've learned of attacks that had already taken place and uh, uh, toward the World Trade Center in New York City and the Pentagon outside of Washington, D.C. And so some of those passengers then attempted to regain control of that aircraft. And during that attempt, however, the plane crashed into the reclaimed strip mine of Stony Creek Township near Shacksville in Somerset County, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania about 105 kilometers east, uh, southeast of Pittsburgh and about 210 kilometers so, uh, southwest of Washington, D.C. A few witnessed the impact on the ground and news agencies began to report of the event within an hour. Now think about this for just a moment. If you were looking up at the sky during that day and you saw that airplane fly over, you would think it's just a regular airplane. It's just on its scheduled event. It's just doing what airplanes do. But you would have no clue of what was happening inside that airplane that day. And the same is true with Christians. Many Christians go through the motion of their Christian life. They hold their Bible. They have their smile. They come on Sundays. They come Sunday nights and Wednesdays and they hear the Bible and they listen to it preached. And yet, we have no idea of what is happening in their heart. We have no idea what, what, is, what is going on in their life. And like Judah, we find that everything looked great on the outside. But God says, no, there's a heart issue. There's a heart issue. I want us to think about number two, the development of a pure heart. So how do we develop this pure heart within our lives? How can we develop a singleness of heart yielded to God? Well, first of all, understand the heart is deceitful, okay? The heart is deceitful. Jeremiah said in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. Listen, our gut feeling isn't the final authority. You know, following your heart is not a good idea. The Bible says our heart is deceitful. It's desperately wicked. James chapter 1, verse 26, the Bible says, if any man among you seem to be religious, if any man among you seem to, to, to put on that form of righteousness or that form of godliness, and yet it, he bridleth not his tongue, look at this, but deceiveth his own heart. This man's religion is vain. You see, our heart is not pure by default. Our heart does not seek after God by default. It's not honest toward God by default. The Bible says it's deceitful. It's wicked. And yet, I find as the Bible teaches us, the nearer we get to the Lord, the more we realize how deceitful our heart is. I mean, think about in Isaiah chapter 6, when I, Isaiah saw the Lord. What was his first response? I am undone. I think of the Apostle Paul as he drew closer to the Lord. I am least of the apostles. I am the chief of sinners. As he drew closer to the Lord, he realized his own heart. He realized how wicked his own heart was. 
understand the heart is deceitful. Letter B, put your heart on trial before God. Have you ever sat down? Have you ever sat down alone with the Lord and said, Lord, search my heart and see if there be any wicked way in me? That's what the psalmist did. In Psalm 139, verse 23, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart, and try me and know my thoughts. Our heart is not the best guide for our life, and we must allow God to search our hearts. We must allow God to show us our inconsistencies and where we come short and, and come to the Lord in that humility. And say, Lord, search my heart. I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I want to seek you. I want to follow you. And I understand my heart is deceitful. And so, Lord, show me. Show me areas of my life where I need to change. Oftentimes, we like to make excuses in our life why we don't serve the Lord, why we don't follow the Lord. And if we allow God search our heart, maybe he'll show us that this withdrawing is a lot different. The reason is a lot different than we think. Maybe it's a heart issue that we're dealing with. And so we seek the face of God. We ask God to, to search our hearts, and then we ask God to change our hearts. The Bible says in Jeremiah 24, verse 7, and I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, and they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Perhaps your heart today is focused on your circumstances. Perhaps your heart is, listen, if I go to church, God, you're going to have to change my circumstances. If I, if I give to you, you're going to have to make things right. And maybe that's your heart. Maybe that's your worship. And God's going to reveal that to you. Maybe you're seeking God for carnal desires. A lot of people believe God is just some magic genie that they can come to God and get all of their wishes come true. That's not the God of the Bible. And so God reveals our heart and God changes our heart as we are honest before Him. And then also we need to guard our heart. It says in Proverbs 4, verse 28, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, sometimes a critical or sinful thought process it begins in our hearts. And our attitude is desensitized uh, about our home or about our church as we follow that, that heart. And, and so what does the Bible say? It says, guard your heart with all diligence. Because from your heart flow the issues of life. You pay life's bills with your heart. And if you don't have a pure heart, friend, then you're not going to seek God. You'll seek other things. Guard your heart from the world's words. Guard your hearts from the, the pictures and, and all the, the music and all the things that are so presented by our world today. Something interesting, in 1946, the actual first run of It's a Wonderful Life was not approved. In 1946, uh, when they first wanted to present the movie It's a Wonderful Life uh, on national television, it was not approved. And, and the reason why, they said these following words were censored. These were the words that were censored in 1946. Jerk, lousy, God, and garlic eaters. We will not have that show on television because of those words. Think about how far we've come. How far we have left the very principles of God. No wonder we need to guard our heart today to protect our heart for everything that's happening. Is there any wonder we find it difficult to trust God? 
Is it any wonder we struggle so much in our walk with God? We can't see God working in our life. God says you need a pure heart. You need a pure heart. The Bible says in Titus chapter 1, verse 15, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. Thirdly, and I'll be done this morning, would you write it down? The destination of a pure heart. Do you really want to see God working in your life today? Do you really want God to be seen as you follow Him? To the spiritual person, nothing is higher than this. To see God at work in our life and in our family. John chapter 1, verse 18, the Bible says, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. No one has literally seen God, the Heavenly Father, at any time. He is a spirit. They that worship God must worship God in spirit and in truth. 1 Timothy 6, verse 16, who only have immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen, nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. We know that Moses saw the glory of God. So how can God be seen today? Well, first of all, God can be seen in creation. Isn't that wonderful that we can look outside on a beautiful Lord's Day and see the sun shining and say, my God did that. (laughs) He made that. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. We see God in our world around us. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 that when we look at creation, the invisible things of God are clearly seen. What are the invisible things of God? Well, His power. His Godhead. His wisdom. His intelligence. His creative power. The invisible things of God are clearly seen in creation. Now when we think of creation, we think of a complex system, and it absolutely is. But think about how long God took to put it all together. Six literal days He spoke it into existence. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 17, verse 8, we talk about the hand of God and His power The Bible illustrates creation as God putting it together with the power of His fingers. It didn't take much for God to make all things. And we see God today. We see God today in creation. But also we see God today in circumstances. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28 The Bible says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. We may not be able to see it right now, but God is at work in the circumstances of our life. And God says He puts all things together for good. And it's not that individual events in our life are good, but when they're all put together, they are good. And God has a purpose in them. We can see the hand of God in our life. The Bible says in Psalm 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Do you want your steps to be ordered by God? (laughs) I hope so. It's interesting, the word fulfilled, it appears 12 times in the book of Matthew. You know, life is a series of appointments with God. And a person with a pure heart sees God working always. Sees the hand of God evident in their life. They see God working through the good times on the mountain and God working in the valleys. They see God in our troubles and they see God in our joys. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There's a wonderful story in our Bibles of the disciples in a ship during a storm. And the Bible says the waves were contrary and the wind was blowing hard. And the disciples were trying to get to shore and everything was contrary to them. They could not get to shore. And all of a sudden they see someone walking on the water. And they say, it is the Lord. God help us today in the storms of our life to say, it is the Lord. That's God doing that. That's God at work in our life. God is able to do that. But friend, we cannot, we cannot see the Lord if our heart is filled with bitterness. We cannot see the Lord if our heart is filled with anger. We cannot see the Lord if we have these expectations that I deserve this Lord. Our Worship must be sincere and honest before God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And of course, we see God in the Bible. John chapter 5, verse 39, search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. We see the Lord in the Bible As we read the Word of God, we're able to see God in His wisdom and direction and principles to live a life that is fulfilled and a life that pleases Him. And so is your heart pure today? Can you honestly say, I'm seeing God at work in my life. I see the Lord. The highest joy of man comes from the cultivation of the deepest part of man, the heart. When the heart is pure, the vision is clear. When the heart is pure, the vision is clear. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 says this, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. No man shall see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You see, Judah couldn't see God because of hypocrisy, because of an unclear vision, because of their carnal desires in their own pathway. They approached God not with honesty, but with expectation. Like a ship lost in the fog of sea, who could not see the light burning bright, Judah had lost sight of God in their life. God help us today to see the Lord. God help us today to be a happy believer, pure in heart, and seeing God at work every day in our life. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much for your word this morning. And thank you, Lord, for working in our hearts and in our lives. We're wonderfully grateful, Lord, that we have this opportunity to open your word and to learn and to grow. And I pray, Lord, that you would direct us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to have an honest heart, that we would approach you and say, Lord, seek and search my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me, Lord. It is my desire, and I know, Lord, it's the desire of every Christian that they would be acceptable to you. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us. It begins even now with an honest heart. Lord, I pray you would help us to follow and to pursue after that pure heart in our life so that we can see you at work to have clear vision as we move forward for your glory. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymn books together this morning if we could. For our benediction, let's turn to 249. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. If you're able to stand together, 249. Just as I am, if God has spoken to your heart this morning, you do business with the Lord. Talk to him. Ask God to search your heart. Let's sing on that first verse together. Just as I i
second verse now. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. If you're a first time visitor, we are honored that you uh, chose to be a part of our service this morning. If there's anything that we can do to help you, please let me know. And then tonight at six o'clock, Faithway will be with us. I hope that you'll come and be a part of that service. God bless you. You are dismissed. Hey, it's Pastor Burns again. Thank you so much for watching our live stream today. Before you leave, I want to ask you an important question. You know, I believe anytime you hear the word of God, it brings us to a place of decision. You have to decide, are you going to listen to God or are you going to ignore what he has to say for our life? Now, the greatest decision that you could ever make is to know for sure that heaven is your eternal home. The Bible teaches us that we have all sinned against God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All of us are separated from him. And because of that, one day we will die. The Bible says that after death will come the judgment. And we want to make sure that when we die, we go to heaven to be with the Lord. Now, salvation is not found in ourselves. It's not found in being good or it's not found in religion or a denomination or anything like that. Salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. God sent his son in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent his son into this world so that you could have eternal life. If you believe the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you believe that Jesus died for you, would you call out to his name today? Would you ask him to save you? The Bible teaches us that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could pray something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve hell, but you died for me to give me eternal life. I believe your gospel. I believe your message. Save me, take my sins away. Now it's not about words and a prayer. It's about a belief in the heart. And if you truly believe the gospel and you called out to God for salvation, then the Bible says you are a Christian. We'd love to hear from you. 
You can go to kitchenerbaptist.org backslash decision. Fill out the easy form and send it to us so that we can send you resources to help you grow in your new found faith. Christian, and when we hear the word of God, we also have to decide. What is God speaking to you about today? Would you say yes to the Lord? Whether it's to forsake a sin, whether it's to follow him in baptism or church membership, or whatever God is doing in your life, would you nod your head and say, yes, Lord, I'll do it, I'll go, I'll follow. Would you say yes to the Lord today? That's the greatest thing in the Christian life that we could ever do. Thank you so much for joining us for our live stream. I hope that you'll join us next time here at Kitchener Baptist Church. It's Pastor Burns again. Thank you so much for watching our live stream today. Before you leave, I want to ask you an important question. You know, I believe anytime you hear the Word of God, it brings us to a place of decision. You have to decide, are you going to listen to God or are you going to ignore what He has to say for our life? Now, the greatest decision that you could ever make is to know for sure that heaven is your eternal home. The Bible teaches us that we have all sinned against God. There is none righteous, no, not one. All of us are separated from Him, and because of that, one day we will die. The Bible says that after death will come the judgment, and we want to make sure that when we die, we go to heaven to be with the Lord. Now, salvation is not found in ourselves. It's not found in being good, or it's not found in religion, or a denomination, or anything like that. Salvation is only found in Jesus Christ. God sent His Son in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent His Son into this world so that you could have eternal life. If you believe the gospel, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and you believe that Jesus died for you, would you call out to his name today? Would you ask him to save you? The Bible teaches us that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You could pray